Get Rich Education is brought to you by Narada Real Estate, Mid South Home Buyers, and Ridge Lending Group. Welcome to Get Rich Education with Keith Weinhold, giving you information and ideas on the investment that has turned more ordinary people into millionaires and billionaires than anything else, and can provide you with more wealth and happiness than you ever thought possible. Now, here's your host, investor, entrepreneur, business owner, and educator, Keith Weinhold. You are inside Get Rich Education, episode 151. I'm your host, Keith Weinhold, and I'm here each week to tell you how busy people like you can build wealth passively with real estate investing. You are here for a purpose, and that purpose is to grow into a mountain not to shrink into a grain of sand by seeing how cheap of a life you can live. Well, most people don't have time to think that expansionary thought because they've got their head buried at work. So we're going to talk about whether or not you should quit your day job sometime and how to know if you're ready. What's happening really is that this show has been on the air for almost three years now. So some time has set in such that many action takers have had their lives change pretty substantially. And we're starting to hear from more of them right here on the show. Today, we're going to hear from a young Get Rich Education listener whom, after investing in real estate for just over three years, has quit his job working in an automotive factory because he has built up enough passive income from real estate to do so. So I'm going to talk to you about why your job might feel so bad to you these days. And also, you know, when you ask yourself that question, where did the time go? Where in the heck did the time go again? Well, I've got an answer for you there. But first, here's a little something that might help you out. Are you using the Apple AirPods headphones? They're pretty great. Wireless headphones, and they're compatible with either Apple or Android devices. And they're just going to make your life better because if you're listening to me, you are an audio consumer. So... The AirPods headphones, they're wireless. They come in a little case that looks a lot like a tooth floss container. It's pretty nice to have your podcatching device in one spot of your home, and then you kind of have this freedom to walk around the house wire-free. They even work for me when I walk outdoors, and the device that I'm listening from is still indoors. The AirPods, they use this optical sensing and motion accelerometer such that while you're listening, you can... Pause the program that you're listening to just by taking an earbud out of your ear. Yeah, it automatically pauses. And then if you want to resume listening, just reinsert the one earbud into your ear that you removed. And yeah, that really has like worked for me every time. And the overall sound quality is pretty good. One definite downside is that you do have to charge the AirPods. I wish you didn't have to charge the AirPods, but one charge does last for quite a while. One set costs between $150 and $200, so they're not cheap. They're not cheap, but neither am I. So, yeah, it's really a better way to live, and who knows, maybe in a few years we'll look back and think, yeah, that sure was weird before wireless headphones when people had two sets of coated wires hanging between your ears and your pants pockets. So I like the AirPods. Now, did you ever ask yourself the common question, I think, where did the time go? I think that really everyone does throughout life. You get these events in your life, whether it's another birthday for yourself that you have or another New Year's Day that you experience where you say things to yourself like, gosh, I'm already 25 years old or gosh, I'm already 30 years old or 40 years old or 60 years old. Where did the time go? Well, just think about where you spend the majority of your active, productive life. It's at work. Now, some jobs don't have this kind of sameness and repetition that other jobs do, but most jobs have this sameness and repetition where you feel like you're using a pickaxe in a salt mine and just grinding out another day. Well, this is why it seems like the day drags on for most employees, but yet while it drags on slowly, paradoxically, it feels like time keeps speeding up because you've filled all that time with experiences that aren't memorable and kind of have this quality of sameness. And that's why you wonder about where the time went. 
there aren't many life milestones there at work while you're trading your time for dollars, selling your time for money. Arguably, I say that life is most memorable and fulfilling to you when it's filled with big highs and big lows. That's exactly when you don't have this sameness. With big highs and big lows, you're less likely to wonder where the time went. Your life is a more experiential journey. When I climbed the highest peak in the 48 states, Mount Whitney, California, with my dad and brother a few summers back, that was a big high. I filled my time with something meaningful. So you need to open up the time for yourself to have opportunities for big highs and, yes, big lows sometimes. So it involves some calculated risks. Zig Ziglar said that those who won't take a chance don't have a chance. And as you're going to see today, our guest took a chance. Well, why does work feel so bad these days? Why else do jobs feel so bad? The unemployment rate is pretty low. Most economists consider this full employment that we're in right now. The U.S. has had a record 75 straight months of job growth under President Obama, and the unemployment rate keeps plummeting under President Trump. The poverty rate has decreased from 19% back in 1964 to just 13.5% recently. That's according to the Census Bureau. Well, then, why do American workers actually feel worse off? Okay, why does lamenting the state of work kind of seem like the right thing to talk about, at least somewhat regularly? Well, part of it is that the numbers that I gave you there are fluffed up based on how the government calculates things. And Oftentimes, the president doesn't have as much to do with those numbers as some think. But beyond that, in the last 50 years, we've had in America these kind of economic and political and social changes that have altered really not just the makeup of the workforce, but also what it takes to get a job and support really just yourself, let alone a family. So what's really changed? Everything's changed. So you had these once dominant industries like manufacturing, and they used to pay well even without a college degree, and they've been overtaken by service sector jobs, most of which are low paying, and the BLS, the Bureau of Labor Statistics data, supports that. At the same time, knowledge-based jobs, that excludes lower skilled workers, and they're the ones that are continuing to grow. The cost of getting a college degree is up more than 1,000% since 1978. That's according to Bloomberg. Millennials are just saddled with more and more student debt. And despite being more educated, they earned 20% less than boomers did at their age, adjusted for inflation. So real wages keep slipping while real student loan debt is up. So you've got these decades of stagnant wages, and that means that both parents must often work to make ends meet, and that creates a need for child care. And elder care, that's stuff that just didn't exist back in 1950, for example, when two-thirds of women were full-time homemakers and caregivers, and that's what the BLS says. And the BLS says that women now make up nearly half of the U.S. workforce. The power of unions has also waned, and some research suggests that that's contributed to lower pay for non-union workers as well. And whether you like unions or not, that's just what's happening. Of course, the gig economy like Uber and Upwork and Airbnb, that's exploded. And that actually, now that does give workers more control and flexibility over their time, but it also gives them fewer benefits and fewer legal protections. And really now, with the gig economy, the boundaries of who's legally and culturally even considered a worker are really being redrawn, but the gig economy is lower paying as well. So America's work structure just doesn't really work with a whole lot of realities of American life today. And really, you've got study after study that show that Americans fear that demands of work mean that they don't spend enough time bonding with their children and connecting with their spouses, or even caring for themselves and their own bodies. Many workers are emotionally and financially drained from juggling the health care costs of aging parents and then the child care needs of growing families. And if you don't have those problems now, you may in the coming decade or two. Americans are constantly just kind of arranging and rearranging these puzzle pieces of work and family, and if they're lucky, a little bit of leisure so that things 
just never really seemed to fit quite right. And then on top of all that, the Census Bureau, they recently compiled the American Community Survey data, and they found that the typical American commute keeps getting longer, and there's a growing body of evidence that show these negative, deleterious effects that these commutes have on workers' health and their emotional well-being. And people with long commutes are more likely to say that they're obese and have high cholesterol and have neck or back pain. So really what you end up with is this putrid, distasteful formula where workplace and public policies are mismatched to what the workforce and families need. So no wonder that work often feels so bad. So you need to ask yourself, does any of that sound like the life that you would have actually chosen to design for yourself? I don't think it was where you work one day and you get paid for just one day during all this, okay? Well, you have to ask yourself if that's the track that you want to be on. I don't like the word track. No one changes the world with a term like career track. No one changes the world with job security. So instead, you actually have an option. You can set up a system to serve others by providing them with sound housing, and with just a little remote maintenance, you get paid forever Rather than working a day just to get paid for a day, well, today's guest has done just that. He is 29 years old and based in Indiana. In just over three years, he's up to 50 units, 50 total rental doors of cash flowing real estate. We're going to get into what it's like to quit your job for passive income. Outside of the numbers, what does your family think about quitting your job for real estate investing? What do your coworkers think? We're going to get into that too. I'm going to tell you something that you've absolutely got to consider. There's one box that you need to check before you quit your day job. Now, you might not be a person that wants to quit your day job. Maybe you're just looking for extra passive income from real estate to give yourself a better lifestyle, and that's okay too. But consider also, now, what if you lose your job? It's taken away from you like a lot of people did unexpectedly coming out of the Great Recession just eight or fewer years ago. If you lose your job, if you're laid off, well, then some passive income sure is going to be a nice cushion to protect your body from being dropped on the hard concrete, okay? That mailbox money is going to give you something that you're going to need to have to fall back on. We're talking with Get Rich Education listener Douglas Orr about quitting your job right after this. Cashflow real estate investors, if you're looking for a mortgage loan with a company that specializes in investment property loans, it's Ridge Lending Group. They provide income property loans in almost every U.S. state. Ridge has worked with tens of thousands of investors and homeowners all over the country. In fact, with ethics and transparency, they've helped more people realize their dreams through real estate investing than any other mortgage lender in the country. Get started at RidgeLendingGroup.com. Are you looking for a roadmap to financial freedom? If so, we have a solution for you. Narada Real Estate is offering a limited number of free strategy sessions to help you get out of the rat race. Learn how you can create wealth and build monthly passive income. To set up a time with one of our knowledgeable investment counselors, simply go to naradarealestate.com. That's N-O-R-A-D-A realestate.com. This is Rich Dad Advisor, Garrett Sutton. To grow your wealth, listen to the always valuable Get Rich Education. Welcome to the show, Get Rich Education listener and real estate investor, Douglas Orr. Hey, Keith. It's great to be here. I appreciate it. Hey, it's really good that you're here. So I don't know a whole lot about you other than that you're a Get Rich Education listener based in Indiana. Where in Indiana are you? I am currently about 45 minutes south of Indianapolis on 74. Okay, and you're married and you've been investing in real estate for a few years here. And I think you really had a motivation because you had a job that you, you didn't really like. So sometimes we might have real estate sort of pulling us in and attracting us toward the outside. But yet if we have something inside, it's also pushing us out and maybe a job that doesn't give us a great deal of satisfaction we have, kind of have both a push away from where we are and a pull into something else. And an attractant like that can really be a motivator. So tell us about your workaday job and then getting started in real estate. Absolutely. I think like most of the investors, it all started with the little book, 
purple book titled Rich Dad, Poor Dad. <laughs> but yeah, I was straight out of high school. I started working in a factory and it was pretty grueling. And so, you know, with Rich Dad philosophy just uh, kind of spinning in my mind, I felt like I needed to do something because there had to be a better way to earn a living or make an income than building vehicles all my life. In 2014 was when I actually started purchasing rental income. Okay, so that's still relatively recently here, just three years ago for getting started. So tell us more about your mindset. Was your mindset kind of becoming one where you feel like you're trading your time for dollars, you're selling your time for money, sort of time's your most important, valuable resource, and you wanted to replace that with something like real estate that can create passive income where you can effectively buy time? In the auto manufacturing industry, you are predicated on the supply and demand. So if the market is buying the vehicle, you have to meet that demand. So on a continuous basis, we were working 40 plus hours a week, working Saturdays, and these aren't optional hours, they're required. So that was something that was really taken away from my life, and I did want freedom. So that was absolutely, it, it helped shape that. When you're losing control of your time like that, yeah, that can be really aggravating. So just tell us about your entry level into real estate and what your first property was like and what you were really looking for that first property to do for you and then grow from there. Okay, well, in 2014, I actually, I borrowed $20,000 from my 401k and I had used that money as down payments to purchase a duplex and a triplex. And I still primarily focus on buying multi-units, but from there I use the profits to snowball into purchasing more rental income. Yeah, and see, now that right there, that is not conventional. Like we discussed before on the show a little bit, it's actually a quote from my friend Dave Zook, either you can be conventional or you can be wealthy. And most people want to build up their 401k, money that they're not going to touch or use until they're in their 60s. And as a young person, you borrowed 20K from your 401K to put down payments into a duplex and triplex. Not conventional, but it might just be wealthy. Absolutely. And it's funny because the employees that were at the uh, 401K company tried to talk me out of getting that loan. <laughs> and they didn't quite understand that I was going to take that money to create wealth and generate income. Sure, sure. The people from the Human Resources Department, they're so conditioned and maybe even brainwashed, to think, well, you've got to save for your future. You've got to invest in your future. What are you doing? Most people don't do this. And you're like, well, what if you can invest in something that helps secure your present and your future simultaneously? It's not really your job to educate your human resources department, but it sounds <laughs> like you had a pretty good idea of knowing what you were doing. So what was your mindset around doing that and investing in that duplex and triplex right off the bat? Was it one of cash flow or appreciation or did you really have much of an idea of what all real estate could do for you during that first transaction it was definitely cash flow play and that's here in indiana things do not appreciate very fast so midwest is definitely a cash flow play and that was the exact thing the multi-units i knew that i was trying to even the odds that if i lost a tenant i could still get enough rental income to cover the spread of my mortgages and expenses to where I wasn't going to take any money from my own pocket to fund the investment itself. Right, and you're kind of starting off with five units there, so you have some stability. If you do have a, a vacancy early on, oh, well, so what? You've still got 80% occupancy, and yeah, you are in that region of the country. I'm sure not specifically familiar with the Greensburg, Indiana market, but you're in that area where you do have those proportions of rent income to purchase price that make a lot of sense, so that was particularly fortuitous for you. Just tell us a little bit more about how you grew from there, okay? You have the duplex, you have the triplex. How are they going, and then what did you get into next? The duplex was actually probably the <laughs> the worst investment I've made so far. It was actually about 20 minutes away. There was a very nice community, very nice town that uh, rents are astronomical in my opinion. And the entry point is even pretty high. So I invested in a smaller town, like I said, about 20 minutes away. And I, what ended up happening was I was getting some of the rift raft from that area because the rents were lower. So with upkeep and all that and not being able to find quality tenants, primarily probably because the town was so small, I ended up getting rid of that property. But that being said, that was on down the road. So what I did 
was my next purchase was a it was two properties on the same parcel of land that totaled four units and I don't know if you want me to talk numbers or not but I actually purchased that property for $69,000 and the rents at that time were right around $1200 a month and since I've owned them you know put some money some sweat equity into it not my sweat by the way I've been able to increase the rents to around $1700 a month so if you want to talk about the 1% rule that definitely beats that right so you're buying in even though it's perhaps not in a 100% renovated condition you're buying in yeah 1200 divided by 69k at well over the 1% rent to value ratio and is that 69k for two units or all four units that was for the entire property now that was back in 2014 it seems like there's a lot more people now that are getting into investments and deals are harder to find and at that time it seemed like I was the only person purchasing properties Right, okay. So you didn't feel a lot of competition and you had an offer that was probably considered more heavily than if you had some competition there. You were not living in any of these properties, it sounds like, and then you were managing them yourself or Yes, I guess technically this whole time I thought it was passive investing. But uh listening to other podcasts, apparently I've been self managing, but so I am currently in three different towns. And I have three property managers that report directly to me, but and they fought, they do the day to day, and I basically give the approval on what work needs to be done. And but as far as phone calls, um, getting the units ready, showing it, applications, that's mitigated to the managers. Yeah, early on there, you realized you were quote unquote working for your passive income. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so you deal with three managers in three different towns there in Indiana, it sounds like. And what are your experiences like there? I mean, being a quote-unquote passive real estate investor, you still sort of have three managers to manage. So you're effectively your own asset manager among three different property managers. So really the question, since it comes down to the metric that we often talk about, your return on time invested, your ROTI, how much time do you really think that you spend once you've got things dialed in with your three managers? How much time do you spend monthly doing activities like reviewing your property manager statements from the, all three of those managers and any other activities related to that at all per month? Well, I can probably even break it down to the week. I would say I spend less than four hours a week dealing with just the day-to-day -day stuff. We have one manager who manages 37 of the units, so that's a lot more work intensive, and that's actually here in the town of Greensburg. So there's a little bit more to that, but they do great, and once you get an understanding of what you expect and what they expect from you, things flow pretty effortlessly, and it's pretty much as simple as having a 15-minute phone call on a weekly basis just to see where we stand, if that, so you know, as the need arises for a phone call. Okay, so it sounds like you're staying fairly active there. And see, one important perspective that you got, Doug, is that you did do some self-management right off the bat in the beginning. And I don't think that's absolutely imperative for a passive real estate investor, but it does help somewhat if you can just manage your own properties for what I tell people is one to two years, because that way you start understanding property management and what it takes. And it is a really difficult job. And sometimes you need to get course with people and it can get abrasive and you need to deal with some personalities. If someone has managed property before, they understand the value of a property manager. And if you've never managed property yourself and you're just doing it passively through a property manager, what I'd tell you is don't just view it as an annoying line item expense. That is preserving your quality of life. And it's just really hard to put a price on that. So, Doug, it sounds like you grew pretty quickly. You have one of your three managers managing 37 units for you. How many do you have total today? Right now, we have 50 that are rental income producing. Me and my wife actually just moved into a new home, and my father-in-law is rehabbing a house right now. So my mother and father-in-law moved into our old home. They're kind of just paying the utilities right now. So family discounts a little bit better than <laughs> the rest of the renters. <laughs> yeah, that's a pretty sweet deal for them. So how many units do you have total now? We have 50 doors that are income producing. 50 income producing doors in just what, about three years time? Yes, at June it was three years, so just over. 
Now, how did you do it? Did you do all these acquisitions of, it sounds like mostly multi-units and apartment buildings. Did you do that by oftentimes making your own down payment or did you add a lot of sweat equity along the way, sort of like you did early on? Or have you done any, it sounds like you don't get a lot of appreciation there on those, but did you do any cash out refinances or 1031 exchanges yet? So just what was your path? How did you get to 50 units in just three years? Well, I'll tell you what, Keith, I listened to episode six, which that was a game changer for me. Right. Um, I was fortunate to get turned on to your podcast. A good buddy of mine, Matt, told me I had to start listening to your episodes, and it, it really changed my life. So I appreciate that from you. And I'll tell you what, my three unit that I bought, my first uh, triplex, I got a great deal on that. And we put in not much. I'm going to say around $2,000 worth of upgrades that in my opinion, needed to be done. So in one year's time, it was actually 11 months, I was on a 10-year mortgage with that triplex because I got in it at such a great price. I thought, hey, pay it off and we'll live happily ever after. But after listening to you and understanding that we need to keep the money moving and the power of leverage, I decided that I needed to refinance that and actually at least lower my payment to put more money in my pocket. Getting the appraisal from the bank, get this, Keith, it actually came in at $22,000 more than I purchased it for. So awesome. I was able – it, it blew my mind. I mean it really did. So I took that money. Not only did I stick a big hunk of money in the bank, I took that money and I bought another three-unit property that also cash flow. And I more than doubled what I was making before I refinanced that first property. That is spectacular, and part of that is you probably turned that 10-year mortgage into a 30-year mortgage. Therefore, you had a lower payment and greater cash flow even before multiplying into an additional property. That's exactly right, Keith. Even pulling out the money, so increasing my mortgage, but going full term, I was able to lower the mortgage by about $100 a month. That's terrific. So you're pointing to Episode 6 of Get Rich Education, which was published almost three years ago now. That's where really a lot of things came together for people, and it's just astounding to me how many people still point to episode six back there almost three years ago. That's where you really learn about the power of leverage, velocity of money, how being financially free beats being debt-free, and it's often driven by the fact that the return from equity is always zero. Absolutely. Let's talk about what this has actually done in your life, Douglas, because you've really achieved a measure of financial freedom. So just tell us about what you've done with your job there in the factory building cars. Well, I've been doing it for about three years. And obviously, if you talk to me more than five minutes, I'm probably going to steer the conversation towards real estate. <laughs> so I absolutely love it. But in three years' time, of I've been putting the money back into investing properties. I haven't been taking a paycheck up until that point. I was putting my money back into the business. And so at three years, at July 11th, I was able to fire my boss. <laughs> and that was one of the greatest feelings that I've ever had, being able to walk in there. I told him, I said, it is with great pleasure that I am putting in my two-week notice. <laughs> Wow, that is awesome. July 11th, 2017, quitting your day job, starting your daydream. What did coworkers think? Maybe some of the coworkers that thought you were a little bit nuts taking 20K out of your 401K to buy a duplex and a triplex years earlier, and other coworkers of that same mindset, what did they think about what you were doing? What did they ask you? What did you tell them? So, you know, starting out, like I said, I talk a lot about real estate. So you get all kinds of mixed reviews. Some people think it's amazing. They wish they could do it. And then other people, and these people do not usually invest in real estate, but they have horror stories from other landlords. The market crashed or they had a terrible tenant or the house was trashed by a tenant, so on and so forth. But I'll tell you what, Keith, if you quit your day job after three years of investing because you're making more passive income than you are from your job, you'll start to see people's eyes open up from the power of real estate. My mother, I think, is still scared to death with the amount of debt that I've acquired. <laughs> right. It is definitely counterintuitive. But yeah, it's got to be debt that's reliably outsourced to tenants with a cushion. And that cushion is our cash flow. And that's what really gives us that freedom. And yeah, it's funny that you say that anyone that you talk to, it's difficult for you to go more than five minutes without talking about real estate. 
once you've invested in real estate and it's changed your life, it can quickly change an introvert like me into an extrovert. So what else did your family think? Any other thoughts from your family? Okay, so your mom kind of being debt averse, which is sort of natural. Any other thoughts or support or non-support from your wife? Or? That right there is huge, Keith. Uh, my wife from day one has been on my team. We were engaged, and she is out of high school, and she worked at a grocery store. So she's a saver, and she didn't have a lot of life savings, obviously. But that girl wrote me a check to invest in one of my rentals before we were married. I already knew she was the one, Keith, but that just really put it over the top. <laughs> I'll tell you what, my father, he's always been a great supporter of me. And frankly, he's believed in any crazy dream that I've had. And still to this day, uh, he does. And I think, you know, even though my mother is a little uh, anxious, you know, I think both of them are very proud of me. And a great compliment, my brother actually told me the other day that he was proud of me whenever I quit my job. That's huge. And that's really one definition of self-made there. Going off and getting a self-education by reading Rich Dad, Poor Dad. Getting a self-education by listening to Get Rich Education and actually turning that into action. A lot of it is counterintuitive, and that's why it's difficult to explain to coworkers and why it's difficult to explain to family. And it kind of comes down to a Robert Kiyosaki quote with what we're talking about here. Savers are losers, debtors are winners. That's from the top-selling financial author of all time, but it's definitely pretty paradoxical. So that's fantastic that you got enough passive income in just three years to go ahead and quit your day job. You do live in one of those regions of the country where you can find the deals. Any kind of cautionary things you'd like to tell anyone, Doug, before quitting your job? It sounds like you had enough support from your family, just enough, led by your wife there. Any sort of cautionary things, anything that someone ought to make sure they've got done, a box that they've got checked before they quit their job? I would say, and this, I was making enough money well before I quit my job to quit my job per se. I would say make sure that you have enough in reserves that you can not only cover the expenses of your rentals, but also support yourself in case there would be a catastrophe or a worst case scenario situation, a doomsday uh, fund, if you will, because obstacles do come up and there are things that happen that, frankly, you don't know to plan for. Here's one cautionary thing, too, with quitting your day job, like quit my day job a while ago, replaced with passive income. Here's the example I have, and you can let me know what you think about this too, Doug, if you went through this. Let's just say you need a number of 8K per month. Say 8K per month is how much you make at your day job, and you want to go ahead and replace that 8K with passive income. Okay, so you've got your 8K from your day job, and then on your side, you've got the real estate passive income starting off at 1K passive per month, going to 2K, 3K, 4K, 5, eventually up to 8K of passive income from your real estate while you simultaneously have 8K from your day job? Well, now your income is 16K, and ostensibly you will go ahead and give your notice to leave your job. Well, now your income is going to drop from 16K down to 8K, okay, because you just slashed off half of your income from your day job. I'm not a huge delay gratification guy. You don't want to delay too much gratification in life because you want to protect your quality of life. But I'm just trying to tell you, you need to prepare. Don't get too used to living at a 16K per month lifestyle if you're going to go ahead and say bye to your day job and then you're going to be right back to 8K again. So just a little cautionary thing to look out for. Any thoughts on that, Doug? That's exactly right, Keith. I did not take an income from my passive income. I was living off of my job. So once I felt secure enough that I was making enough from passive income to leave my job, that's when I started to pull from the business. And that goes to your point where I didn't create a lifestyle that I couldn't maintain once I left my job. I actually, you know, I hate the term live below your means kind of thing, but the few months there, my means were really big, but I was living to a point where I knew I was going to be in the future. Yeah, okay. So you might just be sure to live within your means rather than below your means for a, a period of time there while you were doing both. Absolutely. Well, here you are. You're a young guy. You've got 50 units that are creating passive income. You've got a supportive wife. Well, someone might ask, well, what do you do all day, okay? If you spend four hours a week, which is actually more than a lot of people, four hours a week just managing your managers, what do you do? 
Well, Keith, <laughs> you'd be surprised how busy you get once you actually leave a job. It's actually amazing that I had 40 hours to give to an employer. I'm focusing more on getting healthy. I've gained a little bit of weight, so I've actually got a goal to uh, climb to the base of Mount Everest with a friend next year. But yeah, so reading, I continue my education. I'm always looking to learn so I can fortify my success and also continue to grow my success. Yeah, when I'm asked that question too, what do I do all day? Well, I run Get Rich Education. This is a business. When you work a day job, first of all, you don't have that much time to think about expansionary things or think about what some people call those bucket list things, like you just mentioned, maybe climbing to the base of Everest. You're just able to knock off all these things on your to-do list that you were not able to do when you had a work-a-day job from, like you mentioned, getting fit or all the books that you want to read or all these backed-up chores around the house that you always wanted to get to, and now you can. So that was really the number one thing I told my employer when I left my job, Doug, when they asked, you know, why are you leaving your job? Really, my short answer was because it just takes so much time. <laughs> That's exactly right. I'll tell you what, Keith, I have a great barber. And if you go on a Friday or a Saturday, it's going to take you two hours to get your hair cut. I stopped in there on a Tuesday morning, and there wasn't a single person in there. I got right in. And I, you actually save so much time because you can do things at your leisure when everyone else is forced to be you know, in a cubicle or on an assembly line somewhere. That is such a good point. Yeah, it's sort of that getting a haircut at the barbershop effect. It's just amazing how you're able to get some efficiencies by doing things at off-peak hours. I might go wash my car on a Tuesday at 10 a.m. because there's no one at the car wash and might be able to get a parking spot at my favorite hiking trailhead because I'm able to do it on a Thursday at 12, 15 p.m. where most can't. So, yeah, there are just so many of these little things where we don't just have control of an absolute block of time overall. We can actually pick our times and schedule ourselves as to when we can get the most out of the time we want to spend once we have it allocated. What do you see for your future here, Doug? You're a young guy with all this passive income and all this knowledge. What's next? Well, I've got some pretty ambitious goals, Keith. This year, I would actually, I'm looking to uh, control 100 units. I'm currently talking to three different sellers with a total of 16 units. But, you know, I got four months, so we'll see what we can achieve. We're halfway there right now. By 40, I look to own 1,000 units, and I'd like to produce around a million dollars net income. And then I have a lifetime goal of controlling $100 million in real estate and achieve a 10 to 12% net income a year. I know that sounds crazy. Uh, those numbers sound crazy. But I'd like the listeners to consider $100 million in 50 years is not the same $100 million that it is today. Keith, I'd also like to create a company bigger than myself, which I think that would do that, and wealth that lasts for generations. And so my family can do the things that they want to do, and they're not forced back into a job that, to put food on the table. That is fantastic. That's aspirational. And you know how few people talk that way, let alone even think that way. Most people just don't even have the time to open up and think that way. And that right there, that potential result and goal that you have for yourself, that's the same kind of unconventional thought that began with an unconventional act of you taking 20K out of your 401K three years ago to put down payments into a duplex and triplex. So it starts with thinking differently, and you have totally followed through. So just any last thing you'd like to bring up, Douglas, or tell the listeners here, something you think they ought to know, something that's impacted you, something that they ought to hear? Absolutely, Keith. Mark Twain is quoted as saying, I never let school interfere with my education. <laughs> and then the Bible says in Isaiah 33 and 6 that wisdom and knowledge shall be the stability of thy times. If you continually educate yourself in real estate, you will have no choice but to be successful. And, you know, like we've already been talking about, I'm just an average guy from the Midwest, but I've been able to take the knowledge that I've been given, and most of it's been free, by the way, and apply it to become free of the shackles of employment. And if I can do it, I know that anybody else can do it. And Keith, obviously, I want to thank you uh, for the knowledge that you provide on a weekly basis. Well, yeah, I really appreciate you following through. you got to have a strategy, and it's not just knowledge that's power. It's knowledge plus action that's power. So congratulations on your success, Douglas. You're kind of like a celebrity to me, Keith, honestly. You're right up there with Robert Kiyosaki. I appreciate it. 
Man, nice job. Douglas Orr from Greensburg, Indiana, a GRE listener that's also not any sort of professional speaker, but he did great on the show here, just like the first time that we hosted a real life real estate investor here. And Douglas took a chance by starting out in real estate investing by using his 401k funds. He took a chance. Again, Zig Ziglar said that those who won't take a chance don't have a chance. Douglas left his contact details in case you want to reach out to him. They're in the show notes. Next week, we've got a highly actionable show for you as I'll be talking with you about my recent real estate field trip to St. Louis, Missouri. The following week, the Real Wealth Network's Kathy Fetke and I are going to discuss the state of the real estate investment market today. Special thanks to today's guest, Douglas Orr. He changed his life fast and it accelerated massively when he first heard about Get Rich Education from a friend and started listening. So I would ask you to please tell a friend about the show. Don't just do that for me, do it for you because they might become a regular GRE listener and now you're going to be able to leverage each other and bounce your thoughts off of each other just like our guest and his friend did. I'll be back next week to help you build your wealth. Until then, don't quit your daydream. You've been listening to Get Rich Education, telling you what the wealthy won't tell you about real estate and investing. Nothing on this show should be considered specific, personal, or professional advice. Please consult an appropriate tax, legal, real estate, financial, or business professional for individualized advice. Opinions of guests are their own. Information is not guaranteed. All investment strategies have the potential for profit or loss. The host is operating on behalf of Get Rich Education, LLC, exclusively. The preceding program was brought to you by your home for wealth building, GetRichEducation.com.